This is part one of the lecture on chapter 21, blood vessels and circulation. I'm skipping the parts that I think are just more descriptive, anatomy, types of vessels, things like that. Um, and I'm focusing on the physiology because I think that's the most challenging. All right, so we do need to talk a little bit about arteries. I am assuming at this point you've already read the section on the layers uh, and the types of vessels. If you haven't, stop now and go read that section. You need to know the three layers of the vessel wall, the differences between arteries, capillaries, and veins, the kinds of arteries, the kinds of capillaries you can save till later. We'll actually talk about those. So for now, arteries and veins, because we're gonna talk about circulation um, through the major arteries and veins, and then we're going to talk about capillaries separately. So the main thing about arteries is that they have both elasticity and they have contractility. Elasticity is due to that, those elastic fibers that allow it to stretch and then recoil. Um, so you're going to have a very strong pulse in the major elastic arteries. Contractility is due to the smooth muscle in the wall of arteries. <clears throat> when that muscle is um, stimulated by the sympathetic nervous system to contract, then that causes vasoconstriction. Vasodilation is not caused by parasympathetic. It's caused by just simply slowing down or stopping the sympathetic signals, and that causes vasodilation, which then the pressure of the blood in the arteries pushes it open more, and that's vasodilation. So um, really, to me, this is kind of out of order. I think the most important component to remember is that blood has to flow. So blood flow, which we're going to abbreviate capital F, is what everything else is all about. If the blood quits flowing, then your patient dies. This is circulatory shock. There are different kinds and causes of circulatory shock. Um, your heart can stop beating from a heart attack. You can have brain damage to the medulla where the cardiac centers are. Um, your blood vessels can all completely dilate if you lose the vasomotor center in the brain. You could bleed out. You could go into anaphylactic shock. There's lots of ways for flow to stop, and every one of those is considered one kind or another of circulatory shock. So flow is paramount, but flow is determined by pressure overcoming resistance. So flow is proportional to the difference in pressure. That's a delta sign. That's the Greek letter for D, delta. Delta P stands for pressure gradient. The difference in pressure from the high end of pressure to the low end of pressure. I hope you all appreciate my parakeets singing in the background. So pressure, pressure at any one spot is an important thing to measure, but it's the difference in pressure that allows blood to flow. All fluids will flow from high pressure to low pressure. So you're gonna have high pressure as blood leaves the heart because the ventricles of the heart contract, and that creates very high pressure out the aorta on the left and the pulmonary trunk on the right. And then the pressure has to drop continuously as blood flows from arteries to capillaries to veins and back to the heart. If blood flow didn't continuously drop, then flow would stop. Uh, if, if you try to go from low pressure to high pressure, that's not going to work. It's just going to try to flow backwards, which is why we have valves. We have valves in the heart to prevent backflow. You'll also see when you study the structure of veins that you have valves in the veins to prevent backflow because veins have very low pressure, and gravity alone, when you're standing upright, can uh, prevent the flow of blood back to the heart, and so you need valves in your veins. So we're going to look at the pressure gradient. We're actually going to calculate it at some points. But the point of pressure is to permit flow, to overcome resistance, and so the blood will flow. So we'll talk a little bit about... Um, measuring pressure and then we'll also talk about resistance. So when we measure pressure in the arteries, arterial blood pressure, which is the um, is measured in millimeters of mercury. So the blood pressure leaving the heart at the aorta is about 120 over 80. That's the blood pressure. And generally when you talk about someone's blood pressure, you're talking about the systemic arterial blood pressure. So your average pressure, which is called the mean arterial pressure, is what we're going to use 
as our main measure of blood pressure. When we get to the capillaries, we find that the capillary hydrostatic pressure, just the, the blood pressure within the capillary beds, is what allows um, fluids to filter and causes the exchange of nutrients and wastes. And then in the veins, the pressure in the venous system simply drives the blood back to the heart. Okay, so our overall circulatory pressure has to overcome our overall resistance. And there's peripheral resistance and there's central resistance. The central resistance is just the resistance within the heart. We're going to totally neglect that at this point and talk about peripheral resistance. The peripheral resistance is the resistance in all of your blood vessels combined. And that peripheral resistance has certain factors that are going to... Um, Determine it, and if you look at, at the bottom part of this slide, you'll see that the peripheral resistance is affected by vascular resistance. That's the resistance of the blood vessels. Um, the viscosity of the blood, how resistant is it to being, to flowing, to being pushed, and the turbulence of blood flow. And of these, we're going to see vascular resistance is the one that's the most important. So vascular resistance is due to the friction between the blood itself and the walls of the vessels. Now that friction is going to be determined, at least in part, by the slick endothelial surface, but also by how long the vessels are and how narrow the vessels are. So an adult vessel length is, is constant from one moment to the next, but you can increase it. When someone puts on a lot of weight, adds a lot of adipose tissue, they actually increase the number of blood vessels supplying that adipose tissue. And that's one of the reasons people who are overweight tend to have high blood pressure. There's just higher resistance, and it takes more pressure to overcome that resistance. But it's not something you change on short notice. So the vessel diameter, you can change on short notice. That's what you're doing when you vasodilate or vasoconstrict. And um, there's a formula that I'm not going to ask you to memorize for uh, calculating resistance. But basically, it is, an in, it is an exponential change. As vessel diameter decreases, resistance goes up exponentially. As vessel diameter de increases, it, be, it dilates more, resistance drops exponentially. So you have a lot of control of resistance simply by vasoconstricting and vasodilating. Um, the resistance due to the blood viscosity, again, that's not something you're going to be able to regulate. The viscosity of blood is about four times that of water. That is, blood flows with four times more resistance than water. And so we just say the viscosity is four. Um, most of that viscosity is due not to the molecules, but to the red blood cells. And you kind of need those. You know, about 45% of the total volume of your blood is red blood cells. So you just have to live with that viscosity. That viscosity factor of four or five times that of water is something that you've just got to have the pressure to overcome. And so blood viscosity, while it's a factor that, that matters, is not something you can change just to regulate your blood pressure and blood flow. Um, likewise with turbulence. Turbulence occurs anytime the blood either hits a wall or has to change direction, or if something abnormal like a rough patch in a vessel wall. Um, so this diagram shows you the difference between laminar flow, which is smooth flow in the middle of the pictures, and turbulent flow. Turbulence occurs like in the aortic arch, where the, the blood literally has to turn 180 degrees from going up the ascending aorta to going down the descending aorta. So wherever that happens, there's turbulence. Wherever a branch comes off of a major vessel, there's turbulence. And again, that's something you just have to live with. You just have to have the pressure to overcome turbulence. And the only time it's a factor that um, is going to have health implications is if it's either due to something abnormal, like a plaque deposit, as you see in the lowest picture, or if you have an aneurysm, which is a weak spot in the wall of a vessel. Um, and it, turbulent flow there can actually cause an aneurysm to rupture or balloon. But ordinarily, turbulence is just one of those factors you have to deal with. So mostly what we're going to be looking at when we talk about resistance is vasoconstriction and vasodilation, which is going to affect the luminal diameter. What's the diameter of the hollow interior, the lumen of a vessel? Um, we're also going to see that total cross-sectional areas have an impact. Hold that thought. We'll come back to that. Um, the pressures in different parts 
and the velocity of blood flow. How fast is it flowing? So we're going to examine all those by looking at graphs. And what I want you to do is you look at each graph, just figure out what it's talking about, figure out what it's telling you. So this is a graph of luminal diameter. And from here you can see that the aorta has the greatest diameter of all of the arteries and the inferior and superior vena cava have the greatest diameter of all the veins. That's over on the far right. And that the vena cava have greater cross-sectional area than the aorta does. Veins in general are wider in diameter than the corresponding arteries. That's all very interesting, but to me the most interesting thing is who's the tiniest. And what you see is that arterioles just go from having low to almost no diameter. Capillaries have the diameter just larger than a red blood cell. So a red blood cell diameter is about uh, 8 micrometers across, and a typical capillary is maybe 10 micrometers across, just big enough for red blood cells to go through single file, and that's on purpose because, remember, in the capillary, that's where you're trying to get the nutrient and waste exchange. The closer the red blood cells are to the capillary wall, the faster the oxygen can leave and CO2 come in. So it makes sense that capillaries are the narrowest, and everything... Um, kind of goes from there. So artery arterioles coming into capillaries shrink down, venules coming out of capillaries kind of get wider and wider as they become veins, and then the vena cava. Okay, so this looks, and it should strike you, that it's pretty much the opposite of the previous one. The total cross-sectional area, that is if you took all the capillaries in the body and just kind of bundled them all up, collectively they have way more total cross-sectional area than any other uh, type of vessel. So it's like nearly 5,000 square centimeters total in the capillaries. The aorta, you know, its diameter is only about maybe an inch, so that's two and a half um, centimeters squared or so. And then the vena cava, likely, is pretty small. So again, this makes sense. You're trying to get that blood to all those thousands of capillaries. And so if you sent the blood to all the capillaries at the same time, well, you don't. You just They just mostly take turns. So very high total cross-sectional area in the capillaries. All right, the average blood pressure. Now, this is blood pressure. And so what you're seeing here is a continuous decline. Pressure lowers. It drops continuously from the aorta through the elastic and muscular arteries to the arterioles, the capillaries, the venules, the veins, and the vena cava. And at the end of the vena cava, the, pre the pressure's practically zero. So when you get to the right and left atria, um, the pressure inside, those can actually be negative, which means as they dilate, they're literally sucking blood into them from their supplying vein. So blood pressure drops continuously as blood flows um, throughout either the systemic circuit or the pulmonary circuit. And finally, we get to velocity. And velocity, remember, means how fast it's moving. So it should make sense to you that it's really high through the arteries. All you're trying to do is rush that blood to the capillaries. Once you get to the capillaries, the flow is as slow as it gets. And this also makes sense because the capillaries where the exchange of nutrients and waste is going to occur. And so you need the, the blood to slow down a little bit there. It's not extraordinarily slow. Um, blood will speed through a capillary. Typical capillary, if you're just sitting at rest, it's going to take maybe a second for one red blood cell to start at the arterial end of the capillary and get all the way to the venous end of that same capillary, about a second, and it's about a millimeter long. So that's typical flow, but when you're active, you speed up the velocity of blood, you just get it moving faster, and so what we see with activity is that um, the velocity can increase to about, oh gosh, a quarter of a second, 25% as much time as in the resting value, and yet you're still able to exchange nutrients and waste, mostly oxygen and CO2 when you're being active. All right, so we're going to look, we're going to focus our attention on arterial blood pressure. And before we do, I want to back up and, and remind you of, of why we're doing that. So let's look back to this picture of the pressure, okay? The pressure in the vena cava is practically zero. The average pressure in the aorta is, well, that's not really an average. The average pressure is closer to 100 than it is to 120. 120 would be the systolic pressure. So if we just say the average 
uh, aortic pressure is about 100 and the average pressure at the right atrium or the left atrium is about zero, then our, our difference in pressure, our delta P, is 100 minus zero or about 100 millimeters of mercury. That's the delta P and that's going to determine the flow. Now, what you need to also realize is that veins have very thin walls and they just distend. They stretch out easily. So if you put a little oomph of pressure in a vein, a little squirt of extra blood, they just stretch out. So their pressure doesn't stay high. The pressure in veins is always going to stay low. And so it's the pressure in the arteries that's going to control that delta P and therefore control flow. So we're going to manipulate the pressure in the arteries in order to control flow, to overcome resistance and to control flow. And that's why we pay so much attention to arterial blood pressure measurements. When you measure someone's blood pressure in their arm, you're measuring their arterial blood pressure as sort of a proxy for what the total um, delta P is going to be. And that's what people are going to regulate. So I'm sure you remember systolic and diastolic pressure from... Uh, studying the heart. So, you know, systolic pressure is the high, diastolic is the low. The pulse pressure is the difference between the two. And the mean arterial pressure, or MAP, is the diastolic plus one third of the pulse. So, if you had someone whose blood pressure was 110 over 80, 110 minus 80 is 30. Divide that by 3, that's 10. Diastolic was 80 plus pulse pressure is 10, means the mean arterial pressure is about 90 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so here's just an example of that. Now, if it's too high, hypertension is an abnormally high blood pressure. Now, this is as a disorder. And someone with abnormally high blood pressure chronically has a problem that has to be treated medically. Um, so when we talk in uh, terms of regulating blood pressure about what to do when your blood pressure gets too high, we're just talking about within normal limits and a normal person. So if you just start exercising briefly, let's don't overdo it, and um, your blood pressure gets up and then you sit down to rest, then you're going to take steps to get your blood pressure back down. Um, if you take a nap in a warm room and your face is flushed, then all that blood's out in your, in your skin, trying to cool you off. If you stand up too fast, your blood pressure's too low. You're going to take steps to regulate that, okay? So just as a negative feedback mechanism, not as an abnormal condition, um, when we talk about high BP or low BP, what are the regulatory mechanisms to keep it within the normal range? We're not talking about disorders. All right, now... In the muscular arteries and the arterioles, this is where vasoconstriction and vasodilation are going to control the mean arterial pressure. And the farther away you get from the heart, so imagine your digital arteries compared to your brachial artery, digital arteries in your fingers compared to brachial in your arm, um, the further away you get from the heart, the lower the pressure is going to be. So the mean arterial pressure in the brachial artery is, is pretty close to that in the aorta. It hasn't dropped very much. It might be 88 instead of 90. But by the time you get to your fingers, it may have dropped as, to as much as 80 millimeters mercury. So as you get to the arterioles, though, man, the pressure really drops quickly. And so what you see in this diagram, first of all, you can see the pulse pressure. So you can see that 120 over 80. You can see the dark red line, the mean arterial pressure marked for you. And look at what happens when you get into the arterioles. The pressure practically plummets. It's almost a vertical line down from the arterioles. So to measure the pressure there, what you've got to be able to do is start at the beginning of the arterioles. Draw a straight line as we can. And see what the mean arterial pressure there. It's about 80. And then at the end of the arterioles, which is the beginning of the capillaries, see what it is about there, and that's about 30. So it's going to drop from about 80 to about 30. Okay, so that's a drop of 50 millimeters mercury. Now, from the beginning of the capillary to the end of the capillary, <clears throat> that's going to drop from about 30 to about 15. And that's a drop of only 15 millimeters of mercury, but it's still 50% drop. Now, this drop from 80 down to 40 is a drop of 50. That's a drop of more than 
So the greatest drop in pressure is in the arterioles. And for that reason, we call them the resistance vessels. The resistance goes way up. Let's look back at our other picture um, showing the um, flow of blood through the different parts. And here we're going to see that in the um, cross-sectional area, let's go back one more, that um, when we look at the, the diameter, arterioles have a tiny, tiny, tiny diameter. And look here in this picture and look at arterioles and notice that the cross-sectional area starts out quite small and then it just zooms up. There's lots of arterioles. Each one individually has a very narrow diameter. And because of that narrow diameter, it has this huge drop in pressure that we saw in this picture. Okay, so arterioles drop the pressure. That's on purpose. Capillaries are very thin walled. They would burst if there were too much pressure in them. So one of the jobs of arterioles is to drop the pressure from the high in the arteries where we were just rushing it to get to the capillaries to that necessarily low pressure in the capillaries that keeps the, the capillary wall from busting. So within the capillaries, we still have a very uh, big drop in pressure. It drops by about 50% from maybe 30 to maybe 15. And part of the reason for that is you're actually leaking fluid out of the capillaries. Not all capillaries do, but most of them do. They literally leak fluid out. Some of that fluid's going to leak back in, as we'll see, but some of it doesn't. Some of it is going to instead drain into the lymphatic system. So since capillaries are actually losing volume, it makes sense that their pressure drops so much. And then uh, carrying on with this picture, looking at the venules to the medium veins, to the large veins, to the vena cava, you see at the end of the vena cava just that sudden drop in pressure because blood is leaving the vena cava and just falling into that atrium. And so the right atrium is such a big chamber in the vena cava, just the, as the flood, blood flows in there, the pressure is practically zero. Okay, so the venous pressure is going to determine how much blood returns to the right atrium or the left atrium, and we call that the venous return, the volume that returns every minute. We can um, alter that with venous vasoconstriction. Your sympathetic nervous system can tell your systemic veins to constrict, and when they do, that just drives more blood back to the heart more quickly and increases the venous return. But um, generally speaking, veins are going to have low pressure and low resistance. A um, couple of other things that help return blood to the heart uh, in, through the veins. First of all, veins have valves. Second of all, when you breathe, you inhale air, not, not, uh, not only air into your lungs, but blood into your heart. And um, when you move your skeletal muscles, particularly in the limbs, you drive blood back to the heart because of the valves. Okay, so that's the end of part one, and we're going to stop here and pick up with part two in a second section.